for a little while here. Um, if you have questions, you know, I think there will be time at the end of this. If there's something really burning you want to ask, that's fine as well. Um, and here, uh, we're starting with a, a picture of the, uh, basically the confluence of Peacock Slough and the Suwannee River. Uh, this is down uh, closer to the Dowling Park area on the middle Suwannee. Um, so what, what I'm going to do here is really go over the results at a somewhat high level, but there's so much work that was put into this, there are quite a few pieces to get through. Uh, I also want to highlight some of the more important things, I guess, at least from the uh, district's perspective. And, um, you know, just want to reiterate, too, that while we may touch on the springs a little bit, and that they are part of the system, we're really going to be focused on the river segments themselves here. Um, and also, as you'll see, um, we did work with um, contractors for a lot of this work. And in particular, there were two different groups, you know, one that did the upper Suwannee and one that did the middle Suwannee. So there are going to be a few differences in how some of the work was done related to that. Um, again, back to the, the overview of the Suwannee Basin here. Um, really just want to point out you know, some more things about the geology of this area that kind of relates to the technical work. Uh, so if you look at this from a really high level here, um, you see this, these are all the, the rivers and streams that, that drain this basin down to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, if you look closely, you can see there's a little bit of a change in how those work, uh, or how those are, are formed here, where you have this more dendritic network of streams, and then you get you know, about to this area near White Springs here, and you stop seeing that. And that's related to uh, this, the geology of the area, particularly this feature uh, called the Cody Scarp, which is essentially where that confining unit uh, that separates more the surficial aquifer from the Florida aquifer starts to disappear. And so up here, you know, this drain is just more separate from the, uh, the underlying Florida aquifer. But when you get past that scarf area, you're seeing a lot more interaction between the aquifer and the river itself. You can also see that some in the LIDAR topography data, uh, where there is really an elevation change uh, once you come off of that scarf area. In fact, a lot of the rivers in the district will go underground at some point when you get near that scarf area, such as the Santa Fe, where you have a Lino sink and then the, the river comes back up at River Rise there. And uh, you can see that too where the springs are, are uh, basically located. Uh, where the majority of those are going to be down from that scarf area you know, where the, the aquifer is essentially discharging right into the river there. <coughs> A little bit of background on the basin as a whole. Uh, for the reports that we'll be reviewing as part of this process, I want to say a little bit about how those are organized. Uh, Starting with the Upper Sewanee report that um, HSW uh, really put together for us and did a lot of the analysis for. Um, I will say they've since been, um, uh, I think it's kind of a, a merger of sorts, but they're, they go by Verdantes now, so you may hear that name as part of this. Um, but really the way the report's set up is actually pretty typical where you have the introduction, a section on the hydrology, uh, then one on biology, <coughs> one on the general approach to this MFL development, and then we're, really where a lot of the meat of the report is, is in section five there with the evaluation of the water resource values. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that term means here in a few minutes. Um, and then there's kind of a conclusion section about what those proposed river MFL numbers are, and then the references section. Uh, and then there's also a set of appendices, and these do differ a little bit between the reports. Uh, and I won't go into this too much, but I just want to let folks know here that there are appendices available, and the report and all this information is up on our website right now if you go to the MFL pages for these water <coughs> So for the Upper Suwannee, um, basically the area we're talking about is starting at the Florida Georgia line here, going past White Springs, uh, Suwannee Springs area, and really down to Ellaville would be 
uh, the end of what we consider the upper Suwannee River. And part of that's, that's where the Withacoochee comes in. So the river's quite a bit bigger as you get downstream from there. And that, this stretch does include 79 river miles, approximately. Um, and we've got these two main compliance gauges that you'll see referred to many times in this. That would be the one at uh, White Springs and the one at Suwannee Springs. Now, I'll try to be clear here when I'm talking about the river gauges, because they say White Springs and Suwannee Springs. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the flows in the river, not in the springs at these, at these points. And then the elbow gauge is really what I would consider the head of the middle Suwannee section. So that one's more affiliated with the middle Suwannee work that we've done. Again, just want to show kind of how the geology works in this area. Uh, really, at White Springs, uh, you're coming off that area that's more fully confined. So that's the first point where you start to get more of that groundwater inflow into the river, and more of that connection with the Florida and Aquifer. And there's kind of a semi-confined region, and then you get more to where you know, the river's you know, in that unconfined aquifer area. And part of what that means is you know, there's flow back and forth. You know, a lot of the times, at, at the more typical water levels, the aquifer would be discharging into the river through these springs and through some diffuse seepage. Uh, but um, you know, it's, there's times when the Suwannee River floods that water could start flowing back into the aquifer. And that happens fairly often here. Uh, and you can again see kind of where the springs come in that are pretty related to this change in the geology in this area. And we have nine priority springs on this section. I'll point these out, but we're going to be talking about these probably more in the future at, at different peer review meetings once we develop those in ourselves. And then for the middle Suwannee, uh, this, this work was done by um, the firm uh, Wood for the rest of the, the time. They have since been um, acquired by WSP. Uh, so that name change happened, I think, right around when we were finalizing this report which you'll hear this, this company's name mentioned. Uh, but the way the report's laid out is essentially the same way the upper Suwannee report was laid out. And the appendices are a little different. Um, a lot of the same information is there. I would say Wood uh, wrote up a little bit more of some of their data collection efforts and maybe did some additional analyses in some areas. Uh, so there are more appendices associated with that middle Suwannee report. Uh, so that's all, all laid out here. That if, you're, if you're interested, again, this is all up on our website. <coughs> so the Middle Suwannee River is a little bit longer of a stretch. Um, it goes from this Ellaville area, which is up at the top of the screen here. You see this part of the river is more oriented north to south. Uh, but it, it goes from Ellaville past uh, Brantford. And you have the confluence of the Santa Fe River. And then down at Fanning Springs would be the end of what we're considering the middle Suwannee stretch. And down from there is what we call the lower Suwannee. That area had an MFL uh, that was set um, several years ago. And that would you know, really focus more on the estuarine aspects of the Suwannee River. Um, this stretch you can see, again, kind of related to that unconfined geology. We have quite a few of what we term priority springs in this area. That would be any first magnitude spring system that's discharging over 100 cubic feet per second of flow on average, uh, as well as any of the second magnitude springs, which would be between 10 and 100 cubic feet per second, uh, that are on some type of public or conservation land. And we are, you know, able to add certain springs, uh, like for example, uh, I think it's Royal Spring is a third magnitude technically, but because of its um, the local significance, but we've also designated that one as a priority spring. And there's statute language and everything kind of associated with how those are, are determined. All right, so that's kind of an intro to the areas that, that we're going to be focused on here. Um, I want to say a little bit now about the regional groundwater model that we've been using, because if you recall the way this, the history of this kind of work is uh, we had a lot of this MFL work done as of 2016. And then what we didn't have, though, was a model that really covered 
a large enough area that um, we can really look at the pumping impacts and have correct the data set or adjust it, I guess, would be a better term. To, to, we want to use a, a data set for our flows that kind of takes the pumping effects out. Because that's really the intent of all this, to see how the, um, how the pumping has affected these areas. Uh, so back, uh, I guess, pre- yeah, you know, this North Florida Southeast Georgia model, the Suwannee District, I think we're working with this North Florida model in green, St. John's District, and we're using this Northeast Florida model. Um, yeah, I think those were useful for sure. But it was acknowledged that there were some issues there with them not extending out quite far enough to capture some of the withdrawal areas, uh, particularly up in southern Georgia here. Um, and then also, I think the goal is to have a model that both the Swanee and St. John's districts could work with uh, when, when making their permitting decisions and developing water supply plans and things like that. And so this model is available now. It's something we use quite a bit in our planning efforts here. And this is just an example of what we refer to as a sensitivity map. Uh, this one happens to be for the Ellaville gauge, but essentially we can develop these maps using the NEPSEC model for any point along a river, any spring, any groundwater well. And what this is showing you, this is not showing you the impacts to that gauge. What it's showing you is if you were to uh, either withdraw or inject water into the Florida aquifer at any given place here in the model domain, what kind of effect that would have at that river gauge. And you know, generally, as you might expect, as you're closer to that gauge, you can have almost a one-to-one -one effect. And if you were to take out you know, one MGD of water near that elbow gauge, you would lose one MGD in the river right there. But as you go farther away, that starts to dissipate. Now, but this does give you a sense of kind of where impacts could come from. And it's something we can use when we have our spatially distributed water use data sets. We can kind of overlay those with this uh, sensitivity information, and then that's how we get to our um, our correction or our adjustments to the flow data sets. And there's, that's described in the appendices in detail. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get into that too much today. But here's kind of what that looks like uh, for again the Ellaville gauge. And we refer to these as the, the reference time frame adjustments or RTF adjustments. I see that acronym used a lot here. Um, but basically, you know, this is our long-term data set at the Ellaville gauge that we use for these analyses. And it may not look like much per se, but um, as you get, especially to more recent years where the, the groundwater withdrawals are you know, uh, larger than they were in the past, you see more of an effect there. And so this was, was pretty important to the process to be able to add that water back into the data sets uh, so that all of our MFL analyses are using this adjusted data set that, that accounts for the, the withdrawals that have occurred over this time period. Alright. And then see what this looks like in a little bit of a different way. So these are the four gauges we're going to be focused on along the river. And you see actually some differences here uh, that are, I'd say are interesting. Uh, start down here at the bottom with white, the White Springs gauge. And if you recall when I was talking about the confinement of the aquifer in this area, that gauge happens to be just downstream from where the aquifer, the, yeah, the aquifer starts to be um, a little less confined. But what that means is that upstream of there, there's really little connection between the superficial aquifer and the river and the deeper Florida aquifer. So when you, you know, basically the effects of pumping are not very significant there because of that. Uh, when you go downstream a little ways to the Suwannee Springs gauge, uh, you start to see more of those effects. Approximately 50 CFS or so flow would be, uh, you could say, missing from the river that point due to withdrawals over those time periods. And then as you get further down to Ellaville and Brantford, which are more in the you know, fully unconfined areas, are also downstream of the Lithacoochee and Lapaha rivers coming in, 
uh, you see you know, a larger effect of those uh, withdrawals uh, in terms of their overall magnitude there. So approaching you know, 350 CFS or so in some cases. So that, that was a big piece of kind of updating this MFL work, was getting those adjusted flow data sets together. Uh, once we had that, the next step was kind of to reevaluate a lot of the other um, work that had been done. Uh, and so getting these data sets together, uh, basically we're using four you know, long-term USGS gauges. Um, here I'm showing the period of continuous daily flows. There are some other flow data, especially in the early years. Um, but it wasn't continuously being collected. So it was decided that really the best period of record we could use for these would start in 1938, water year 1938 to be clear, uh, at the two upper Sawani gauges. And then we were ending in 2015, as I said earlier, because that's really when our water use data set um, ended at that time. Um, a little different for the middle Sawani gauges. Those data sets, uh, I think, were deemed to be good a little bit further back in time. So those started in 1933, uh, really in October of 1932 is when the water year starts. Uh, one other thing I'll point out here is three of these gauges were pretty much in a, you know, established back in the 1920s, early 1930s. The Sawani Springs gauge, though, I started more in 1974, and so there, you'll see in one of the appendices, there was some work done to basically hind cast those flows using other data in the area. Uh, and so we, we felt like that worked out um, well enough to be able to use that as one of our MFL gauges here and, and start that in 1938 as well. All right, so that's kind of a little bit of the hydrologic background. So let's get into more of the MFL work here. And again, I'd just like to reiterate from statute that you know what, what we're tasked with doing here is developing this limit in which withdrawals would be significantly harmful to these water bodies. And we are somewhat distinguishing that from other things that could cause changes in flow, uh, such as uh, climate change, for example, could be driving up evapotranspiration rates and leading to changes in flows that way. But that's not something we you know, are able to directly manage as part of our water supply planning process. So while well, that's considered, uh, we are really focused on the withdrawals as the causes of significant harm here. Uh, we're also tasked with using the best available information, which you know, it's, it's basically what we would have in hand when this MFL process started. So while we may like to have other information, and maybe even information that came online in the last year or so, um, you know, we're really focused on using whatever information <coughs> was the best available at the time um, to really start to this work. And then we're also given some guidance as to what aspects uh, to look at when we're developing an MFL. This is in, in rule, uh, these are referred to as water resource values. Uh, there's 10 of them uh, that we're required to look at in some way. Um, I will say the bulk of the work is going to be in these areas here, especially the fish and wildlife habitat uh, is, a, is an area we have some pretty well developed approaches for at this point. Uh, but for these MFLs, we also looked at recreation, sediment loads, and water quality. Um, and fish passage, of course, that's kind of part of the water or the fish and wildlife habitat value. Uh, there are several other values here. Um, for example, we when we did consider these, but like estuarine resources, that's really more down in the lower Sawani area, and that MFL would kind of account for needing the flows coming up from upstream, you know, to to meet those MFLs down at the estuary. So that wasn't really you know, considered a further. Uh, for this MFL work. And you know, similar to some of these others, they're, they're just, uh, you know, you'll see in the reports as to how those were kind of considered. Uh, but for some of these, like the trial transfer, you know, there's just not a lot of well-developed methods at this point to, to do that type of 
you'll see kind of why those were considered or why we felt like those values were covered by some of the other analyses that were done. So specifically for both the upper and middle Sewanee, uh, there were really four water resource values that were the focus, as I just showed. So recreation, we'll, we'll go over the paddling and boating metric. For fish and wildlife habitat and fish passage, uh, we looked at both general fish and gulf sturgeon passage. Uh, we looked at gulf sturgeon spawning depth, uh, this in-stream habitat analysis, and floodplain habitat. And I'll go into detail on each of these. Um, and then for sediment loads, that was uh, looking at bank full and allu alluvial ridge crest conditions. It's more of a geomorphic type of metric. And then for water quality, um, really the focus there for this work was this, uh, the conductivity needed for gulf sturgeon spawning. Uh, there were some other analyses done with water quality, but nothing that was able to be taken to the step of developing an MFL. All right. Before getting into those, I do want to uh, at least try to explain this percent of time area method. Um, for those who are familiar with the way the Southwest Water District does MFLs, this is this should be pretty familiar here. Um, but essentially, the the approach here is to determine for a given metric, in this example, using the floodplain swamp inundation, um, what flow would it take to inundate that swamp sufficiently to maintain that ecosystem there. And so a lot of the work's done to go out and survey these areas and figure out like what that elevation is, and then you can use that information to figure out what flow you need to hit those elevations. In this case, it was 7,531 CFS. That occurs about, for that period of record we're looking at here, back to um, 1938, that would happen about 4.4% of the time, or you can think of it in terms of an average year, it would be 16 days a year. And then we apply a 15% change to that. Um, that is, again, kind of a precedent. That's part of this percent of time or area approach. And that gives you that change that would be uh, allowed before significant harm would occur. And so in this case, since it's not happening all that much anyways, it's a pretty slight change from 16 days a year to 14 days a year. And then you figure out what flow that would have been uh, at that specific exceedance, uh, which is that 7,000, excuse me, 956 CFS, which is about a two day a year change. And then basically you can subtract those two flows to get what the, the flow change that would be you know, allowable before significant harm would occur uh, for those floodplain swamp metrics. Uh, and then at that flow, that would be you know, about a 5% change there. So I know this is pretty complicated. Um, there is another way of kind of looking at this. I don't know if it really helps for a lot of folks to explain kind of how this works, but I um, wanted to show this anyways. Um, you're kind of looking at you know, the flows here on the, the left side and how often those occur, essentially what we're doing is you know, taking that flow that's the threshold, figuring out how often it occurs, doing that 15% change, and then coming back up, again, figuring out what that flow is. And it's the delta between those two that's really important here. And in this case, it's 425 CFS. So. So for each of the metrics I'm going to go through, this type of analysis was done. Um, and I have all the detailed calculations if we want to get into that some. But um, yeah, I think you'll see in the report kind of more clearly how that's laid out. Um, and then the other piece before I get into more of the metrics individually is uh, how we use this HECRAS surface water model. That's pretty integral to a lot of this work, and you probably can't see all the type or the text here. I apologize for that. Uh, this is kind of an output from the model here, showing this is the middle Sewanee section, and it's showing a profile view of the river here, uh, with these being the elevations of the top of the water surface, and then the bottom of the river. 
So you can see starting down at around Fanning Springs, the river's a lot deeper. Once you get up past the confluence of the Santa Fe, you start to see more of these shallow areas where the shoals are located. And that's what this text is pointing out, is a lot of the shoals that, that were part of these analyses. And this, this image happens to end at Ellaville, but we have a similar model for the upper Solani area. Um, so we use this model quite a bit, and um, I'd say for, for multiple purposes. Uh, one is that a lot of these metrics, like I've shown with the floodplain inundation, are based on hitting a certain elevation. So we need to be able to figure out what flow you need to generate that elevation. And that's one way we use this at graph model. Uh, the other reason, or one of the other purposes, is uh, we kind of take all of this MFL information and apply it at these specific MFL compliance gauges. So where we might do an analysis, say, here at the Lafayette Blue Shoal, and we would determine what flow you need uh, to, um, you know, whether it's fish passage or floodplain inundation, whatever it is, at that location, we need to be able to translate that to the appropriate river gauge that we're using for as an MFL compliance gauge. Uh, so that's another way we use this model. With that, let's get into some of the metrics here. And I'll start with the, the recreation, the paddling and boating metric. Uh, this one was handled a little differently between the two river segments here. Um, so for the upper Solani, there was actually some additional information they were able to work with, uh, where there are basically recommendations as to what levels you would want to paddle or boat down the river. And in this case, the really the ideal condition would be above, well, between 51 and 59 feet. So what we used there was 51 feet is kind of that threshold uh, below which uh, you, know, you would harm the ability to boat on the upper Swanee River in that area. Uh, for further downstream, where we didn't really have that kind of guidance, I'd say a more standard approach was used that was looking at um, having two feet of inundation uh, over a 30 foot width. And uh, that's basically we looked at all the shoals along the middle of Suwannee to figure out where the like, most limiting shoal would be, kind of the highest one up that would be the most uh, difficult to paddle over, or in this case, uh, take a motorboat over. Um, and that happened to be La Bay Blue Shoal for that stretch down from Ellaville. Uh, pretty similarly, uh, the fish passage analysis, uh, this is for general fish, as the term that's used. Uh, we have a different metric I'll show you for the Gulf sturgeon. Uh, but in this case, the, the limited shoal for the upper segment was at Big Shoals. And the goal there was again to look at all the shoals along the upper Solani and figure out which one would need the most flow in order to have this 0.8 feet of depth over 25% of the channel. And that's how that analysis was done. Um, similar for the middle Solani, same approach was used. And Lafayette Blue Shoal was one of the, lim the limiting shoals in that area. And then, kind of a unique feature to these portions of the Sawai River is the, the use of this river by the Gulf Sturgeon. So, I want to say a little bit about those fish. Uh, they're pretty interesting. They're, they're an ancient fish species uh, whose ancestry goes back over 200 million years. Uh, they can get pretty large, uh, up to about 9 feet, almost 400 pounds. Um, and they can live 20 to 25 years on average, or even over 50 years potentially. Um, but unfortunately, they are uh, federally listed species. They are threatened uh, in this area. Uh, and their, their habitat basically spans from the Suwannee River as their easternmost area over to Louisiana. And um, yeah, there is actually federally designated critical habitat for these fish uh, in the Suwannee River here. And so the way the sturgeon really use this river 
is uh, they're an anadromous fish, so they, they would live more in the, the ocean, or in the Gulf of Mexico in this case, uh, but they spawn and reproduce up in the freshwater portions of the river. And there's actually three known spawning grounds for sturgeon in the Suwannee, which are approximately in these locations. That would be at Indian Shoals, Nobles Ferry, and Trillium Bluff, uh, close to where the Alapaha River would come in for the Suwannee. Um, so this was something we, we did focus on for this MFL work. Um, we looked at the spawning grounds specifically uh, to make sure the, the depths and the water quality would be appropriate. Uh, but also importantly, the fish need to be able to get over the shoals and get to those spawning grounds. Um, and they do this actually two times a year, we know now. Uh, there's a spring run where the fish will come up and spawn, but there's also a, a fall run. And sometimes the fish we found out now will, will stay in the river uh, through, through the summer as well. But I think it's something the, the researchers that, that study surgeon are still kind of working on. All right, so let's talk about the spawning depth analysis that was done. This is really more focused at, say, on the upper Sewanee area, because that is where these spawning uh, grounds are located. Um, here, what you're seeing, this would be the elevation at the Indian Shoal site, which was the more critical shoal because it needed a higher uh, flow rate to inundate that one. And essentially, that shoal be, starts to become inundated at 245 CFS uh, at the White Springs gauge. Uh, and then the metric here is to have six feet of water over that shoal. Uh, so that, that's where that MFL threshold comes from is this 1931 CFS. Again, this is using our HEPRAS model to take stages at that shoal and translate them up to both the White Springs and the Suwannee Springs gauges. Um, another analysis that was 